Happy holidays, my fellow pals. Thank you so much for tuning into the Pals TV, the experience podcast, the haven where we focus on positivity, appreciation, love, and support. You know, I just want to start off by saying I am super stoked for this holiday season, you know, like around Christmas time, that's typically like, you know, my favorite holiday, like not only because it's my birthday and yes, my birthday is on Christmas, <laughs> but I'll get into that later. But like the thing that I really love about the holiday season is the fact that there's like just so many like the, the pretty lights and the decorations and the Christmas tree. Oh my God, it's just all so gorgeous. And I forgot to mention Christmas would not be complete without Mariah Carey and the Home Alone movies, <laughs> specifically Home Alone 1 and 2. We don't talk about the third one. <laughs> but yeah, overall, this year has been a pretty rough year, especially for me. But you know what? I'm going to continue to maintain the Christmas spirit because at the end of the day, I know that all of us are going to get through this in the end. So, since we are still in quarantine, I know that Christmas 2020 is going to be a little different. And I have to admit, you know, I'm a little, you know, sad that I couldn't watch, you know, the Union Square Christmas tree lighting this year, but circumstances, under the circumstances right now, it's totally understandable. But you know, within this holiday season, what I've been doing to, you know, keep myself entertained is I've been decorating, I've been baking cookies, of course, binge watching Christmas movies, but ultimately something that I want to learn how to do is bake gingerbread houses. My gosh, that'd be so like cute. <laughs> My gosh. Oh, and as I mentioned earlier, yes, my birthday is on Christmas, like straight up. I always get this question. So you get two presents at once. And I'd say, yes, I do. I do get two presents, but the way that it works is pretty interesting. So here's how it works. So I get two gifts, my Christmas gift and my birthday. <clears throat> Sorry. So I get two Christmas. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So. I get two gifts, my Christmas gift and my birthday gift. The thing is, I open my Christmas gift on the morning of the 25th, but I have to wait until nighttime to open my actual birthday gift. So that definitely makes sense for me to open my presents on the actual time I was born. <laughs> anyways, anyways, anyways. On today's episode of the Pals TV Experience Podcast, I'm super excited for our next guest in which today we're going to be discussing love and support. So for the pal that we are featuring today, I really admire the work that our fellow pal has committed with regards to film as well as her advocacy for social equality through filmmaking. You may also recognize her as the current president of the President's Filmmaker Fellowship at San Francisco State University. So. With that being said, let's put our hands together for the amazing Wenzi Huang. Oh my gosh. Hello, Wenzi. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you so much for, you know, joining us for this, you know, exciting episode of the Pals TV Experience podcast. You know, I just really hope that finals went well for you. How are you doing today? Hi, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is my first time being on a podcast. So I'm very excited to be here uh, with you and also being a part of this project. Um, so far, I have been, I, I would say I've been doing well. Finals went well for me. Um, I think right now I'm just sort of at this curve where I feel a little bit guilty to relax. I think after a whole semester of just constantly grinding, it feels kind of weird to just settle and relax for a little bit. Um, so I've been trying to tune in with myself, reading a bit. Uh, I've been getting into watercolor painting as well. I'm not the best at it, but it's it's fun, you know, <laughs> to do. Um, so yeah, other than that, I've been doing well. Awesome. That is really great to hear, Wensi. And you know what, I really have to agree with you because it's like, you know, I mean, I'm really glad to hear that, you know, the finals went well, but you know, it's like, you know, typically after the semester, especially when we head into winter break and summer break, it's just that weird feeling like, oh my gosh, we're all, we're done. We're done. It's like, I've been, we've been working so hard and all of a sudden it's like, now we're in break and it's, it just feels so weird at the point where it's like, we've been working, grinding, grinding, grinding. And now we're at the point where it's like, oh my gosh, now things just stopped. And it's like relaxation. It just, it's just. It's like such a weird feeling, but what I like is that, you know, you're doing what you can to keep busy, especially with, you know, reading and watercolor painting. Oh my gosh, 
of course, it's like, you know, watercolor painting, that's really nice to do. And, you know, I'd love to learn how to do that one day. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of YouTube tutorials nowadays. So that's where I've been resorting to. Awesome. Definitely check those out. <laughs> perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So starting off, I would actually like to learn a little bit more about you and your experiences with filmmaking. I was wondering if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Um, so my name is Wincy. I have been a filmmaker, I guess you could say, since I was about 12. I actually started my YouTube channel around 2012, 2013, and I was primarily just making singing and dancing covers. Um, one of the covers that I'm most proud of was, I think I was probably 13 at the time when Miley Cyrus came out with Wrecking Ball, and um, I did a cover of that, and to this day, it's still my most viewed cover. Um, so I mainly started as simply doing that, and I started editing and really kind of self teaching myself how to edit. Um, at first, I was using my mom's um, was, I think it was like, a, just like a regular PC laptop. And at the time, it still had like the movie editing app that you could use. And so I was just trying to like figure out how to edit my videos include like fade ins fade out, you know, and then also trying to toggle with um, including audio so that it sounded a little bit better um so the karaoke wasn't so faint in the background um so that was my first experiences with filmmaking um was really just with my sister's old camera or my mom's like webcam from her computer and then trying to learn or self-teach myself how to edit um on the editing app that Windows had at the time that was still free. <laughs> and then later on, I realized that once it was time to apply for colleges, I was down to picking between either going to San Jose State for criminology. And it's quite hilarious why I chose criminology. And it was because I was watching a lot of criminal minds um, during my senior year. And I was like, oh, this would be a cool job to do. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized, like, I really don't want to be like seeing such sad crime scenes every day. So eventually, I decided to go to San Francisco State. And I have never changed my major since I've only added a minor. Um, in race and resistance studies. And since then, I really kind of found my meaning and why I wanted to do filmmaking. And that is because I think growing up watching a lot of Hong Kong TVB dramas, I rarely would watch Hollywood produced films besides like maybe Disney Channel. Um, but that was pretty much it. And I think that once I was old enough to, you know, study film theories and all this social justice, um, all these social justice topics was sort of when I really solidified that I do want to make films that are more accessible to especially um, like my community and um, I come from an immigrant family. So, you know, showing them like a Hollywood American film, like a lot of times, like the cultural aspects of it doesn't really make sense. Um, and also it's like, you're not really seeing yourself on TV or in film. So it's just like, it's kind of harder. Like it's definitely much harder to relate. Um, so that's sort of where I got my inspiration to make documentaries was because I really wanted to, um, make films in different languages that were more accessible and educational for the immigrant experience. And so that's kind of where I am now. So that's my journey with filmmaking. All I got to say is, Wincy, you know, thank you so much for sharing your journey with filmmaking. You know, that was, that's a very good, like, you know, path that you took. So I just want to say, like, you know, starting off, I remember that you mentioned that you did YouTube covers. You did YouTube covers? Almost, I don't know how to sing myself. And it's like, you know, I mean, of course, it's like, you know, there are times when I try to sing myself and then it's like, oh my God, I just sound so horrible. I sound so horrible. But it's like that funny thing where it's like, oh my gosh, I sing in the, sh if I try singing in the shower, I'm like, oh my gosh, I sound good when I sing in the shower. But when I like actually try to sing like at a karaoke, like, you know, 
or like let's just say hypothetically make a cover i was like oh my god i do not sound good i do not sound good so i have to give props to people who you know have been you know you know like you know uploading covers of them like you know singing because it's like it's really good because it's like you know not only does it show like the talent that they have with singing but it also like you know reflects the confidence they have so you know i really admire you for that one see that's really good the uh, the other thing that i also want to talk about is you know i remember that you were mentioning that you would do some of the filmmaking stuff like you know on the on your mom's computer and then it was i'm assuming your um i'm assuming the editor you probably used was windows movie maker or either either windows movie maker or sony vegas i'm assuming but you know it's really great. It's really nice that you actually like, you know, taught yourself how to like use these editing programs, like, you know, self teaching yourself. That's honestly the way to go with regards to like learning how to use the software. So it's like, that's really amazing, Wensi. And I'm, you know, it's like you've, it's like with this, all the work that you've been doing, it's like you're, it's like, you've worked so hard, Wensi. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna like teach myself how to do like, you know, how to use this software and then how to like um, just get keep getting better. So it's like, you know, I really admire you for that because it's like the process of like, you know, self growth and self teaching. That's, you know, really wonderful to do. So with that being said, the next question that I wanted to ask was, what do you advocate for? And how do you promote your advocacy through film? That's a really good question. I think that I guess backtracking a little bit to when I was talking about how I chose to minor in race and resistance studies, which is um, which is pretty much like an emphasis from the College of Ethnic Studies. I I really think that as a Chinese American, um, you know, my parents had immigrated here, and my father was actually a refugee. He was a refugee of the Vietnam War, and. Um, he was a child refugee too with his family. And so I think that as I got older, I just found that a lot of the American or Western narrative about what China is like or what Vietnam is like or just what like what they claim to be a quote unquote third world country, sorry, what a quote unquote third world country is like is definitely very off from the truth. And I think that there is an aspect that is true. Like there are very dark things that have happened and um, a lot of cultural things, for example, in China where society has long been very patriarchal um, and in Vietnam where, you know, the the living style is definitely very different from, let's say, the American suburban living style. And so for someone to go abroad and, you know, see that they're living in villages and stuff, in their minds, they're thinking of the Western perspective of this is so sad, they're so impoverished. But at least hearing from my father's perspective, it's like those were the best days of his life, really. That's when he was really able to live his life to the fullest, I would say, because you had so little, but you had so much at the same time. There wasn't anything like social media or technology or, you know, it was all about helping each other out to survive, you know, and um, survival did not really mean like the more money you have, you know, the more pride and, you know, stuff that you can show off, like, like how it is here, where there's such a, um, there's such a drive, you know, for like capitalistic gains and profits, you know, everything here is definitely very individualized. And um, everything is all about money, money, money. And I think that that's where I sort of see that there is definitely a very vast difference in terms of I personally too have grown up watching like Disney Channel or I as I got older I would watch more like American films and um, you know and I felt like at some point too I started believing that western narrative of what my heritage is um, and I think especially during this coronavirus when we have a federal administration that has continued to target 
um, China for the virus. And honestly, at this point, we don't know where the virus originated from. And, you know, we're still trying to discover that um, as a research community, as um, a global community. But I think that that's sort of made me realize that I do want to advocate for the other perspective that is so often not seen and is so often not accepted by a Western perspective that believes that with their power, with their, you know, quote unquote, advanced technology, that they're somehow, um, that, that somehow their voice is more powerful and overrides the perspective of, you know, the people that they call are from third world countries. And I think that that's truly something that I realized over time. And it's that I think there is such an importance to showcase the stories of people who have survived um, these atrocities that were, as a matter of fact, a result of like colonization. And, you know, these were things that I really solidified and sort of learned um, through like a solidified curriculum through my time in ethnic studies and um, through my time also in the Metro program on campus, um, where we learned a lot about sort of the corporal or corporations um, in the US. And so I think that in terms of what I advocate for, I'm really just trying to advocate for the truth on the other perspective. You know, I think, you know, not to invalidate the Western perspective, but I think that there are always multiple sides to a story and that all sides needs to be listened to before there is a final verdict that is made upon what, you know, what the more powerful side thinks is right. You know, because for, I think on the Western side, like I mentioned, going to a village in Vietnam and seeing how, you know, they don't have running water, they don't have like heat in their houses, or, you know, they don't even have like a, like a house with a driveway, you know, this type of thing. To them, they see it as that's such a sad life, you know, but again, like looking from my father's perspective, that was really when he was the happiest. He had such really, he had a hard childhood, but it was a very happy childhood from what he was telling me. And so I think that that is something that I advocate for. And I think it's really important to, as, as a, as a woman, um, as a Chinese American woman, I've learned over time how difficult it is to have your voice really listened to um, in a room full of males and not saying that all men are the same, but I do think that there is, there has long been cross cultural (laughs) similarities where society is very patriarchal. You know, you listen to the man, you know, the man is like the leader of the household or the leader of the company. And I think that that is far too, (laughs) outdated. I think that we are all people and all of our experiences are valid, but it's also, again, important to listen to all sides of the story before there is a final verdict made. Um, So I am here to also advocate for um, women's voices. Um, And I myself, I'm most familiar with like the Chinese American female experience because I myself am Chinese American. Um, so, you know, I'm advocating for more of us to be in the film industry, um, and to have positions of power where, or leadership roles, I should say, not really positions of power, you know, because I think power should be distributed equally, um, however that may look like, but yeah, I think that I'm also here to advocate for the voices of women, um, especially Chinese American women, um, as I'm more familiar, but I'm really here to advocate for all women. Um, But I'm here to specifically share more so of at least the Chinese American woman experience of my own um, that may, you know, speak similarities and volumes of other Chinese American women. Um, So that's sort of how I got into the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship uh, was that I found a community that also felt the same way, also had experiences of their own that were 
um, not the best <laughs> in like film sets and such. And so um, that's why I decided to join. And I know we'll get into that in a little bit, but that is what I advocate for. I advocate for the perspective that is constantly unheard of because of oppression. Um, and I also am trying to advocate for the voices of women and um, I'm here to share my experience and maybe the experiences of other Chinese American women as well. Lindsay, that was very beautiful. You know, that was very beautiful. I really like, you know, the stuff that you fight for and the two points that you brought up with one, you know, present the truth because every side has a story. I agree with you on that. And the other thing that I really, you know, admire that you fight for is, you know, the voices of women for like, you know, women to be able to, you know, be able to have an opportunity to voice their perspectives. I guess starting off the thing that I'll first talk about would be, you know, you know, showcasing the truth. So I remembered like you were mentioning that with specifically like, you know, with Western civilization, there is unfortunately an unfair bias whenever they showcase like, you know, other countries, especially Asian countries, because it's like the way that they showcase them, like they would show like emphasize like the poverty and some of like, you know, the struggles. And then it would like, you know, give it would like enforce that gaze like, oh my gosh, this is it's sad. Like this is a sad and like situation and then of course it's like gonna put that perspective into the audience is like oh this is a sad country but then I really like how you argue against that perspective by you know using your father's you know experiences growing up and I agree with you okay it it, it just may sound a bit cliche but it's that you know it's that saying money doesn't buy you happiness in which in terms of your father's experience it was more so I'm a, it looks like it's more so the community and, you know, everybody being together and working together as much as possible that, you know, helped make it like such an enjoyable time. So I really like that you present that example. And then in terms of, you know, fighting for the voices of women, yes, there's unfortunately like many instances where it's like whenever like a female wants to like express her own like opinion, it's like, People, it's like, you know, people are so quick to talk down on her or invalidate her own experiences. So, of course, what I'm speaking on is like more so in terms of like, you know, what I've observed in, in, you know, Western patriarchy. I mean, if I have to be honest here, I don't really know much about, you know, the patriarchy in other countries, unfortunately, but, you know, because I know that some Asian cultures tend to be patriarchal. I mean, they tend to like, you know, have this aspect of patriarchy but then of course it's like the only thing that I'm ultimately familiar with is like how it works in the western civilization so of course it's like I kind of want to I would actually like to learn more about like if there's similarities or how it overall works overall yeah definitely I think that um I think a film that really I recently just saw it and I know it's such a classic the joy luck club um I remember watching that film recently and I was just really emotional watching it because it was really the first time that I've seen an American film of the Chinese women perspective that was quite accurate, I would say. You know, my mother, um, she's an immigrant from China, and she was telling me how a lot of the things that were talked about in the film uh, were definitely true. Um, and in Chinese culture, there has long been this, this sort of idea where a male is preferred over a female. And luckily, my parents weren't so crazy about that idea. They just saw their children as their children. And everyone has a blank slate, you know, when you are born. So they just saw it as you're just another human being, you know, there's not really like, because if you are one, you know, if you're male or if you're female that, you know, your fate is determined. It's, it's, I think it's more so like everyone is born with a blank slate and they do have the opportunity to change um, their situation. I think that's also what my parents saw. And so I think that that's where I see a lot of, um, I think that's, I'm most familiar again with like the Chinese 
um, perspective of like patriarchy where there has long been a preference for males over females because there's just this idea that (laughs) if you have a son that, you know, they would be able to bring pride and, you know, wealth and um, just like all of these great things into the family. But again, that's not ever guaranteed, you know? And so I don't know. I think I'm just sort of, I I think I've seen that for so long um, or I've heard of those stories so much that I really do want to bring light upon ensuring that women do get the equal opportunities to um, to really like continue their their drawing on their blank slate um, because again they are people as well and so they should have the opportunity to determine their fate. Mm-hmm. No, I I agree with you there. You know, so because. I feel like an important thing that tends to come up is that they often have this assumption where, unfortunately, this is something that tends to happen a lot. But whenever, like, you know, they want to, whenever, like, people want to advocate for females' rights, you know, like, fair opportunities or equality among women, it's like, I don't know why, but for some reason, like, the of course, the, the patriarchal society wants to be, like, they want to have that assumption where if a female were to stand up for herself, then they all then they somehow automatically have that image of female supremacy when that's not even the goal. What they just want is like to have fair opportunities and to not be like, you know, and to not have their voices looked down upon. It's mm-hmm. upon. But of course, it's like I don't unfortunately, you know, society always works that way where every time some a person every time like a community like that's you know a struggling community wants to like you know stand up for themselves then all of a sudden the dominant like communities are like oh this person wants to to do supremacy I'm like that's not what we're doing we just want to fight for our rights right I think everyone just really wants to have a fair and equal shot and Mm -hmm. until you are given just like the basic necessities you know the basic tools it's it's sort of impossible to really reach that equality that we have long been fighting for Mm -hmm. as women um and again it's i think it has a lot to do with seeing just people so differently you know i think it's about realizing it's like we are all people you know we have more in common I'm sure than we do in terms of like physicality, you know, we all have, we all need food to survive. We all need water to survive. You know, we, we all want what's best for our loved ones. We all want what's best for ourselves in order for us to thrive and be happy, find joy. And in those circumstances, we do have a lot in, uh, in similarity with each other. Um, And I think that to take that opportunity away from someone just for the profit of one dominant group, that's where there is definitely a problem. And that's where we have seen a lot of groups um, (laughs) this year standing up for the inequalities that continue to happen from history to now. Um, And so I'm glad that there's a lot of social justice advocacy work that's being done this year um, to speak out on the atrocities that these dominant groups have long oppressed um, what they see as minoritized group when in reality it's just groups of people wanting an equal shot. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree with you there. Like we mentioned unfortunately the dominant like you know ideologies tend to um, always like overshadow those voices and it's pretty unfortunate and it and the thing that we're discussing right now it actually kind of you know in a way segue is to my next question that I wanted to ask so um so I know that you Wensi are the current president of the feminist filmmaker fellowship and you know I really admire the club and its values because you know I definitely agree the film industry needs to be more diverse and inclusive and you know and I'd say you know starting off film is a great way to you know promote advocacy, and I must admit that. And then from what I noticed in terms of the industry, it is very male dominated, okay? And I feel that women and fe- and you know people of color should also have fair opportunities to be represented fairly in the, inter- 
in the industry. Therefore, I actually wanted to discuss, you know, more about the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship. Um, so I guess the first, the, some of the stuff I wanted to discuss were, you know, what um, what is like, you know, the club's mission and aim? And then what do you all do in the club? And I guess maybe some origins as well. Sure, definitely. Uh, so the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship was founded um, back in the spring of 2019. Uh, we were officially, I guess, chartered then, you know, like on paper and um, we started tabling and uh, recruiting and that's really when it began and it was really because a group of women had their own experiences that were similar but also different but overall it just again really tried to shut down their voices and not give them the equal shot that they deserved um, to have their work done in the way that they want it to be and so I joined back in the spring of 2019 and I I went to the first meeting and I spontaneously rose my hand and was like, I will serve as the secretary of the club because at the time they needed a secretary. And so super random, honestly, um, I just decided to join. And then I remember that night I actually went back to my dorm and I was, I got very emotional. I just wasn't really sure if I made the right choice um, and also what I was stepping into, if it was really for me, if it was, you know, a battle that I would be able to handle because there is a lot of, there is a lot of tug of war, I feel like, when talking about advocating for rights for all filmmakers to have the same equal shot that we've been talking about. Um, so I wasn't really sure if I was ready to face that battle. Um, and so then as the secretary, because it was so new, I started off just, you know, I was taking like meeting minutes and such. I had quite an extensive experience in high school being um, secretary uh, for leadership and such. And so I was primarily taking meeting notes and sort of keeping the club organized in that way. And then I sort of realized that um, my experience with social media was starting to take off in terms of I started managing um, the Instagram and Facebook accounts with uh, posting like marketing materials. So a lot of the flyers were made by myself. Um, and then I started doing like email newsletters and that definitely brought me back to like my high school days um, when I was in key club and I would have to do a lot of like email newsletters. Um, so I sort of tapped into my old experiences and really let it flourish, I guess, during the first semester. And then that's sort of when I decided to do more. I wanted to have more of a role than just, you know, marketing and taking meeting notes. Um, and again, like my goal as a filmmaker is really to create ways that are more accessible and allows for more perspectives to be told. And so then I began what was called All About Women Wednesdays. And that's when I would say I really sort of developed more of my role in F3. And that's when I held three discussions. Um, they were roundtable discussions, but you know, because it was quarantine, it was more of like a virtual discussion um, where I organized three discussions around the topics of uh, Women's History Month, um, sort of our journey as women to where we are now. And then um, another one about how climate change um, and environmentalism um, can be advocated more in film. And the third was actually a felt in May. So I decided that it might be good to tap into API roots and um, because it was Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I think. Um, and so I decided that that would be a good discussion to talk about how we can 
uh, really sort of steer away from this like Western model minority myth that is kind of bestowed upon Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders um, throughout Hollywood's history. And then I began to realize that I wanted to run for president and um, I ran for president um, and then we voted and I luckily was elected. Um, I have people, a community that believed in me and my work. And so then, then it really sort of began this year. Um, I think that F3 is really and still continues to uphold our mission of creating spaces for female identifying and non-binary filmmakers um, to really have a space where they can, where they have a voice that is not only going to be heard, but really listened to um, and where they feel safe and included. And so this year um, with COVID and everything, I think that there is a sense of me that also recognizes that a lot of our membership, um, as we're expanding, we're also having a lot of members um, about to graduate, including myself. And I think that there is something that's so liberating when it comes to a female being able to financially support herself. Um, there's something so liberating about that, um, at least from my own experience as well. And so I really, my goal really shifted to enabling that our members feel secure when they graduate, that they have some sort of resources and tools that will allow them to be successful um, in the film industry, but also to ensure that they are able to financially support themselves and grow professionally. And so that's where I uh, brought in uh, that's where I connected with uh, professors um, from the School of Cinema, and that's how we were connected to her productions. Um, and then also we had some workshops with uh, Tracy Ward, um, Sumya Barons, just so many professors that have such extensive experiences that, you know, will provide members with a perspective of there are all of these different ways to reach these goals of yours, but it's up to you which path you want to take, which steps you want to take. And again, like giving them that opportunity where it's like, you have this opportunity to learn all of these things and you have all of these resources for you to gain those tools in your toolbox so that again, like everyone has a fair shot at um, whatever that they hope to accomplish really. And so that's sort of where F3 is at. You know, we host a lot of workshops. We also have done some socials. Um, we had some screenings uh, before COVID happened and yeah, that's sort of what we have been doing. We try to incorporate educational experiences with, you know, opportunities for professional development, but also for there to be fun in it. Um, because, you know, we're all in classes all day long. And, you know, it's like, I don't want it to be another tedious thing for members. I do want it, them to be fun, um, which is why I think it's really important to allow the rest of the board, which has really grown this year, um, the opportunities to let their ideas become real life. And um, so that's sort of where F3 is at um, in terms of our evolution. And that's sort of what we do and sort of my role in it. I'm just a little sliver from it though. Like <laughs> there is a whole team, a whole village of women behind me and um, without them, it really wouldn't be where it is now. So, yeah. <laughs> so I must mention Wednesday, you know, the club, like, you know, the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship, I'm really glad to hear, you know, about its success and, you know, it's, expanding and growing it's like there's really a lot of progress <clears throat> that's happening with it and you know 
I'm really proud to hear about like, you know, all of the growth that's happening with the club and, you know, even in the future semesters, I really hope that the club, you know, can expand and become bigger because I feel like, you know, more people need to be aware, not only about the club and also joining it, but they also need to be aware of like, you know, some of the things that all of you do in the club, especially like some of the missions and some of the things that you all advocate for. So talking about your experience, um your experience I remember that you talked about like you you um that you on the first day like that is so like you know I I really admire you for that because um (laughs) oh my gosh because it's like you mentioned like on the first day that you um volunteered to become secretary and you know given that you mentioned that you had past experience doing secretary work you know it ended up um it ended up being like some of the past work you did like back in high school with regards to key club and leadership so you know i'm really it's really nice to hear that you know i'm really glad that you know to hear that you know that you you know took initiative to um proceed with the position as the secretary and then you know it's like as time went by of course it's like you work your way up and now you're the president of the feminist filmmaker fellowship and you know hearing that you know you were able to network with not only with professors, but also her productions. It's just, you know, it's really amazing to hear, you know, all of that. And there, and there are, and you even mentioned that there were some other events that um, hosted by the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship, unless if they're, yeah, I'm assuming they're events like the, like the, like the F3 discussion. So it's like, you know, I mean, all of you are really, you know, doing so much in the with like the club and it's like I could already see like you know it's just so it's like expanding and it's like getting bigger and bigger and you know it's like you know I really hope that you know I wish you all the best of luck with with like you know how it happens and you know I as much as possible you know because I remember like when I I came to the meetings you know I really liked it a lot like you know it was such it was like a very like you know it was like very like everybody there was like you know really nice and respectful and on top of that it's like you know it was a very engaging and you know collaborative you know meeting and club so it's like you know I really liked you know the vibe of the feminist filmmaker fellowship so I really like to be hearing you know that the feminist filmmaker fellowship you know advocates um especially for you know women's voices especially through film and you know I just really hope that you know the club ex- can continue to expand. And, you know, I na- I'd encourage, you know, my fellow pals who are going to SFC right now, you know, you should check it out. It's really, it's a really good vibe and it's a really good club. Thank you, Daniel. I'm glad that you felt, that you felt that way when you went to our, uh, when you went to our meetings. I'm glad that you felt that it was a welcoming environment and that, um, you know, you and um, SF Doc. Film Institute has long been so supportive of us and um, helping us promote our programs. And it's definitely harder to promote programs, I think, nowadays um, with everything being virtual and there's Zoom fatigue. And so there's always sort of uh, a harder recruitment now, I think, because everyone's just so tired. And, you know, I understand that Zoom fatigue is real. And so thank you for all of your support. Um, as well for F3 throughout all these times since we've been founded. Thank you so much, Wendy. And, you know, you're welcome for all the support. And, you know, even going into winter break and also like the future semesters, you know, I'll I'll make sure that, you know, we at Doc Film can continue supporting the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship. We'll make sure that, you know, even in the future that we could continue to support um, F3 no matter what. The next thing I wanted to ask was, so I know you directed your own documentary called Home. That's correct, right? Yes, that is correct. Awesome. So I really have to give you props for, you know, directing and then doing the writing and as as well as editing. So I was wondering if you could, you know, um, give us an overview of what the film Home is about. Sure. Um, So Home is about, well, quite honestly, I just, I was home and... I think that when I was home starting in March 2020, when the lockdowns were first implemented, that I think there was sort of a struggle and kind of like an identity crisis that I was, uh, that I was seeing, um, where it's like us as Chinese Americans, 
or us as Chinese immigrants even, like we have come to the United States and there was the Chinese Exclusion Act and then them because of, um, you know, China being communist and just sort of like the Cold War that was happening between um, what what is now Russia and um, the U.S. I, I think that, you know, any... I started to see a lot of this pattern where China is scary, it's scary, it's scary, you know, but again, like, at least how I see it, it's like, I don't really, I'm sort of in the middle, like, I see the good and the bad of both government um, ideologies, um, and also styles of leadership. I'm sort of in the middle, but I think that with these ideas of a democracy or communism, it's that, I think that at the core of it, it's, there are good intentions. I think, you know, all of these ideas start off with a good intention and it's to make people's lives better. But if it falls in the hand of the wrong leadership, then of course it won't be great. Of course, it's not going to be, um, it's going to be exploited. And so I started seeing a lot of this pattern where it's like China's scary on the news and the federal administration was calling it the Chinese virus and the Kung flu and all these crazy things that I was just thinking like, wow, like have we... Have we not grown, you know, as a, as a community? Um, And so I think that that's sort of where I started seeing like a, like an identity crisis within my experience um, being a Chinese American here in the U.S. And um, my parents having been uh, one, a refugee and one, an immigrant. um, I just wondered how their experience was too, feeling like, you come here because you want to provide a better life for your family and for your future generations. And because what life is like at home is just unfortunately not ideal. And so you come here for something better and, you know, you come here, you, and you do everything that you are asked of you to do, which honestly may end up exploiting yourself, but then you are again like like the history of the Chinese Exclusion Act and now where it's it, there's all this blame on China and again like we don't know exactly where this coronavirus um, or the strand of coronavirus has come from we don't have official results yet but again I just saw that there was you can never be too Chinese and you can never be too American and it's how do you find a home within a home that doesn't, that sees you as just an outsider, you know, you know, that sees you as the enemy. And, you know, when my parents immigrated here or when they first, you know, sought refuge here, you know, my dad was a Vietnamese uh, refugee, you know, and, um, or Chinese Vietnamese refugee. And my mom was a Chinese immigrant. And (laughs) both of them, when they came here, you know, they were seen as the enemy. And so now again, like we're being targeted and it just made me really, I just wanted to give them a chance to voice who they are, that they're not this scary, oh my God, you know, like crazy, you know, virus, you know, because they're not, they're just people. And again, it's like, we really need to start seeing people as people and allowing them the opportunity and also really listening to their perspective and their stories. You know, you may not necessarily agree with everything that they do, which is only human, but again, it's like giving the necessary tools to someone um, and giving them a chance. And so I really wanted to ensure that my parents, as well as my grandma from my mom's side had the opportunity to share their experiences. Um, and sort of what they are doing to stay sane, you know, um, 
and during these really trying times. And I really wanted to make it also accessible to them because English is not their first language, you know, I don't want them to have to, and my grandma doesn't even speak English. So I didn't want them to be not themselves. I really wanted them to be their most authentic selves, you know, um, with their authentic responses. And, you know, they're not like, they're not film theorists. They're not a film person, if anything. They enjoy watching like TVB dramas, but, you know, they're not like, like, you know, like they haven't studied film theory or anything like that. So I just really genuinely wanted to capture that authenticity that they have. Um, and so I decided to interview them and have them answer in whatever language that they felt most comfortable with. And all three of them chose Cantonese, which is um, the language that we spoke primarily at home and we still primarily speak at home. And so um, I think that it really is about, um, too, I wanted to showcase their stories in their own native language or at least whatever language that they felt most comfortable with. Um, because I think for so long, it's like the immigrant experience is about, you need to learn to assimilate into this culture or this society um, in order to fit in, in order to do this, in order to do that. But again, it's like, in the United States, we are all immigrants, um, unless if you are of indigenous um, background, we are all living on stolen land. You know, we should all, we are a melding pot of cultures and we have had a painful history as a nation. We should all be understanding and trying to learn each other's stories better and be better listeners. And so that's why I decided to have to keep it Cantonese um, primarily until it got to my voiceover. And then, um, you know, include some subtitles here. So it was accessible to the audience who was watching that wasn't, um, that did not understand or speak Cantonese. So that's sort of where home came from. It really did come from my home, <laughs> my childhood home. It was actually filmed there. Um, <laughs> and it was filmed with people who have long tried to fight for this home for myself, my future generations, um, because they were just trying to seek better opportunities and a better life. So for their selflessness, I think that I really wanted to show their stories in the most real and truthful ways um, against all of the uh, scariness that has been on the news at that time. You know, I really like how with the film that you made, it's like, you know, you're tying, you know, with the name home, like, you know, I actually starting off, I really like that you chose the name home because it's like, when we think of home, we always think of like, you know, the shelter, like, you know, like where are we going to reside in? But then there's also like that connection to also our cultural background and our identity. Like when we um, suggest like the term home. So of course, like, you know, Talking about like, you know, the way that you um, made home, that you you made home by tying it to, you know, of course, like, you know, as well, you know, like, um, of course, like, you know, how you're living right now. And then as, as well as some of the background experiences. So I really like how with home, you're exploring like multiple perspectives from those. But I feel like the thing that also really makes it genuine and I feel like this is really what I really liked that you did was when you went to um for this one you went to interview also your mom and your grandma so of course what I really like is that you actually had that in Cantonese because it really it, re it really reinforces the idea of home and culture so it's like you know the home documentary I really like the way the styles that you put into it so you know, I'm hoping one day I could actually check it out one day. <laughs> it was actually um, screened during the cinema tool for uh, class screenings in the mm -hmm. spring. Um, I was lucky enough where my film got selected. Awesome. And so, yeah, that was my first time having my work screened. And I was like, wow, I've never had this before. <laughs> so <laughs> that was very fun and very interesting. 
what I will say is, Wednesday, you know, I hope you do submit that to other film festivals. With regards to the Doc Film Institute, because we did have a film festival called Essential Stories. If we have another one, I would encourage you to submit it to that and then keep continuing to submit it to festivals because, you know, we definitely need to have those, you know, voices heard. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. So what I wanted to also ask was, so currently you intern for Universal Pictures, if that's correct, right? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Awesome. So what I wanted to ask was, what is your role? And based on your journey, do you have any advice on how aspiring filmmakers can land an internship? Definitely. Um, so currently, I intern with Universal Pictures. I've been interning with them since the fall of 2019. And I serve as their Campus U marketing representative um, for San Francisco State specifically. So I believe that this program is on if I remember correctly, I believe it's on 80 plus campuses nationwide. So um, usually they select one representative from these universities to promote and host like free screenings, giveaways, uh, really just to promote film releases um, to students and faculty uh, before it's even in theaters. And so um, during my time, I've hosted one screening um, at the Coppola, actually. It was for the show Sunnyside, and we also had an episode of Superstore, and that was in collaboration with the Cinema Collective, uh, because honestly, I had no idea how to book places, number one, and number two, I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing, so I was just like, I need some help, um, so then I that was like the first group that I reached out to um, at the time the feminist filmmaker fellowship wasn't yet born. So um, that was the only film club I knew of. And that was when I first entered the major was when I landed the internship. And so now because everything is virtual um, I've held three programs and I know Daniel, you attended um, a couple of them um, where I was promoting the release of the film Freaky and um, I incorporated some like fall themes into it, um, pumpkin carving, pumpkin spice lattes and spooky mocktails for Halloween. Um, so that's sort of what I do is that I really try to build excitement, momentum. I try to market um, films and their release dates and trailers, um, their social media pages to the SFSU community. And so I think that my journey with internships, besides Universal, I have been a post-production intern as well as a research assistant under the guidance of director and Asian American studies professor Valerie So. Um, since my very first semester, I would say, at SF State, um, I started interning quite early in my college career because I was just, I think I've heard so many like advices from so many different counselors or it's like you need to get your foot in the door like it's not about who you know but like or it's not about what you know it's who you know so I was just like freaking out sort of um early on in my um college career and so that's when I applied to a lot of internships and such and honestly like I did not know how to format a resume and so like I was so inexperienced that when I applied to Universal I actually downloaded the resume that's automatically generated from Indeed and like of course it was like surpassed two pages which is like I remember career advisors always saying like your resume should only be a page to two pages and mine was like five pages because I just didn't know how to like consolidate and I didn't know how to format things um I'm sure if I knew how to like format it that it would have just been like one to two pages but of course I didn't know how to do that so <laughs> I applied in like my most like beginner level way I was just like you know what like this is this is really all I know like 
I don't know how to format a resume, but at least I have one. And like, and I just sort of, I just took my shot at it. You know, um, I've heard so many things over the years, like since high school even. Um, but I think that there is a sense of, at least something for me that I've recognized is that it's important to recognize that as a college student, there's still a lot of things that you have yet to learn. There's a lot of things that I still don't know about the film industry. And with COVID, I haven't really had much time to work in film sets because it's just not safe to do so. Um, But I think it's also important to just not spread yourself too thin. I think it's important to recognize that you do have skills that are that are that are your talents and they should be seen as that they shouldn't just be like exploited um again like your voice as an intern um your voice as an intern really matters and again I I don't think it's like I've heard so many things throughout my time where it's like settle for anything and like um you know if you're kind of like bossed around just like accept it and it's just like but I think you should also be doing things that make you feel like what you are learning and also um, your time there is a respected and also b that you are genuinely learning something in a manner that uh, in a manner that or in a community that really does want you to thrive And that's something that I have found um, throughout my time with like also interviewing at different places is that um, I can now sort of see where my work is is genuinely valued and um, also like listened to. Um, I've interviewed for places before where it just seemed very iffy and it just didn't sit right with me. And I think it's important to listen to your gut. Um, you definitely don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable, but you feel like you have to, you're obligated to feel uncomfortable because you have to build your resume. You have to build yourself up. Like there's so many opportunities nowadays for you to build yourself up. It doesn't just have to be with interning somewhere where it's like well renowned you know like again I just got very lucky you know in terms of I honestly have formatted my resume in like all the wrong ways that any career advisor would tell me um, but I think because I had a passion for it and I wanted to have these screenings be places where students can talk about Um, such a core value of SF State, which is very much wrapped around the topics of social justice and advocacy. At first, my supervisor was a little bit skeptical about it, but I think over time, um, you know, it's, it's evolved, you know, times have evolved. And so, yeah, I think my advice is just that it's important to recognize where you stand um, definitely like if you're really new, you know, like, like myself, like, I just don't feel like it's my place to be like, Hey, I can't do this, 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 you know, and I'm not going to do it. You know, like, I think that's sort of like, you need to recognize your place. I think definitely. Um, and also be open-minded to criticism and be open-minded to growth and failure and changes. I think that's a given, But I think the other side of it is also recognizing that you do have talents that are valuable and not valuable in the way where it's just loosely exploited. You know, I think that it should be valued in a way where you are able to grow from it in an environment that really wants you to thrive, um, not just for like the profit of their company. So luckily with my time at Universal, I feel like I really had that chance to find my voice, to really allow my ideas to go in all different directions um, so that I still, you know, keep to my social justice and advocacy center or core um, with hosting like these funds, screenings and everything. Um, I think Universal is definitely allowed me to do that. And I'm glad that I found a place that 
um, I've got, I'm glad that I found a company that has allowed me to intern with them in a way where I'm able to grow in those aspects and find my voice. Um, I'm also very grateful that I've had other internship opportunities as well. Um, that allowed me to see a more like small business sort of viewpoint um, where there's not like a huge distribution team behind them like Universal, where it's just very more like small and tight knit um, for like a, a smaller but very important um, documentary that, ho- that holds a very important story. So yeah, I think there's not really ever a right or wrong way, but again, I think it's important to I think it's important to recognize where you are, but also recognize that just because you may be a beginner does not mean that you should let anyone disrespect you um, and step over you or yell at you or anything like that. Um, Because that's personally things that I've heard many times. And I recognize that that's just not having worked in places that's kind of toxic like that. It's like, it doesn't allow for anyone to grow. So it's important that you find a place that is good for you um, and you all work together well. So that's my TED talk (laughs) on internships. That's really, really like, you know, helpful advice, you know, in regards to people who are like, you know, wanting to seek an internship. And then I really like that you first like gave the example of like, you know, your story. And it's like, you know, of course, it's like, you know, the mishap with like, you know, and the resume, of course, like, you know, mistakes happen, but at then at the end of the day, you still got the position. So I feel like that's a very like, you know, inspiring story because it's like, with regards to like, you know, finding a job or like, you know, unfortunately it's always like they have that instance where it's like, oh, it has to be this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. You have to look your best. You have to be, to look your best. But, but when you like give the example, it's from what I'm getting is of course, it's like, you know, don't like be so hard on yourself when trying to find one of course like I remember like you mentioned like with regards to finding an internship they talk about like networking is like the important part but I feel like after like you know hearing your perspective I feel like with regards to trying to find an internship I feel like the most important thing is just to keep trying and you know don't be so hard on yourself don't be so hard on yourself you know when trying to find one just you know just keep trying and you know if it just so happens that, you know, something doesn't work out, then just, you know, just keep trying again. Just don't, just don't give up. I actually like how the advice you give not only connects to like, you know, academics or professionalism, but then it also focuses more on like a personal route. So I really like that advice that you offered, Lindsay. Yeah, thank you. I I just personally like, think that right now, especially with COVID, and I I think I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this uh this interview uh, where you asked me how I was doing. I was like, you know, I feel kind of guilty that you know, we're heading into break and I'm not doing anything. And I think also with COVID right now, it's like I'm personally, and I'm sure a lot of graduating or upcoming graduates are worried about not being able to land a job or an internship um, that will give them very valuable experiences. Um, And for a moment, I kind of had to step back and really think about like, it's really important too that I'm able to take care of myself first. Cause I think when you're constantly applying, 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 it's, it it does take a lot from yourself as well. Um, Lately, I've been applying a lot again because of job search now. It's not just like internships. It's like, all right, we're like about to head into like the real workforce now. you know, I am seeking these opportunities that will allow me to create films, but also will allow me to actually like sustain myself in order for me to make films, right? And so, um, but I also recognize too, recently I talked to a professor about this where I feel like very guilty of taking a break even if it's just for a day, you know, and not applying to anything, not looking for anything. And the professor was saying that you really should take a break because you've worked so hard that, you know, and also it's the holidays. And that was like such like a mind boggling thing to me. I was like, you're right. It is like the holidays. It's probably going to be kind of quiet <laughs> like for these next two weeks. 
Um, and I've also heard someone else say like, you know, keep applying, keep applying, like put yourself out there. And it's, yes, it is important to put yourself out there, but I think it's also important to listen to yourself and what your body is needing, um, what your mental health is needing, um, which is why like, you know, these last two days, I just decided like, I think I really do need to take care of myself. And I am just simply not going to look at anything because I have been, and I'm going to give myself the credit that I have been applying and looking this whole year. And this is like the one break that I think I should really take for myself. So I think there's also that side too, where it's like, it's important while you're trying to look for internships and um, and apply for internships that you're also compassionate and graceful with yourself um, when you do need to, when your body is seeking for you to take care of it. So I still struggle with self-care for sure. <laughs> that workaholic, um, workaholicism, if that's a thing, <laughs> like I still definitely struggle with that. And I see that a lot too with my peers. But I think that this is something that I've learned um, this last year. And um, yeah, you know, like take it with a grain of salt if you decide to take my advice. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> but that's also like, you know, of course, it goes back to the idea of self-care, you know, self-love. That's definitely like, you know, a very, imp- that's really important to like, you know, to like emphasize, you know, when trying to like, you know, find a job or land an internship, you know love and support, you know, especially like towards ourselves, you know, that's some, that's an aspect that I definitely feel is important. And, you know, since we're like, you know, talking about like, you know, love and support and like, you know, about self-love and self-care, you know, in a way, I guess I kind of want to shift gears a bit into that topic. The next question that I wanted to ask was, you know, shifting gears into love and support, how would you define each of the terms love and support? Um, So I actually chose these two topics because Um, As some may know, I have been in a long distance relationship now for, well, we definitely go like on and off with long distance, like during the semester before coronavirus, it was like, we were able to be together because we're both students at SF State and we both lived at the time like on campus housing so I could just walk like maybe five minutes <laughs> and but then there would be times in the summer or like during the holidays when you know we wouldn't be together because we're from opposite sides of California and so that's where I actually chose this these two topics and also um, I'm working on a recent documentary about how students are managing long distance relationships friendships family relationships um, because I myself had to go through five months without seeing my partner when the lockdowns first happened. And so um, I think that what love and support means in that way, um, I think there's love and support when it comes to your friendships, your partner, your family, um, where it's definitely kind of hard to say like there's only one way to do it. Um, It would be ideal if you could just like communicate with them like, hey, I I am seeking this (laughs) sort of like this is my love language and stuff but like obviously there are language can mean different things for people and so sometimes it may actually lead to more like it could be even more frustration it could even be more problems you know we never like we don't really know um but the thing is is that I think that love for me it really kind of ties into unconditional care. Um, As someone who has gone through a lot of growing up within like these last like 10 years of my life, um, a lot of like, I like, you know, I moved out when I was like 14. And then I moved back in when I was like 17. And then, you know, it was like, and then I moved out for college. And then, you know, then I moved back in for the lockdown. And so there was like all this sort of like growing up. And with all this growing up comes with meeting new people and um, making new friendships and then having some failed friendships and some failed relationships. And I think that now that I am reaching my early adulthood, I just turned 20 back in September. um, 
and who knows, maybe I'll look back at this a couple years from now and I'll be like, Ooh, you were so cringy. Um, but <laughs> I think that love to me really means unconditional care. And I think that I've heard a lot of, I'm here for you, you know, like, let me know if you ever need anything. And then when I do reach out, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know what to do. And then sort of just like pushes me away or um, uses language that makes me feel like a burden. And so I think that love to me means that unconditional care where your capacity to care for the other person is actually communicated so that there isn't that sort of, I guess, false expectation and as a return, false hope. And I think that support also comes hand in hand with that, where it's, if, I think that when I have heard people tell me or past friendships, um, where it's like, if you ever need anything, like, you can always, like, reach out to me. And so I don't think there's ever really, like, a time, you know, when, like, you end up really needing a support system. You know, sometimes it could be, like, randomly at, like, 5 p.m. in the day, or it could be, like, 3 a.m. at night like it's just I don't think there's ever really like you don't set your feelings to react at a certain time you know it's just life happens and there's been many times when that's happened to me in past friendships and I would reach out to those who had said that they would be there to support me and and then I end up not you know being supported whatsoever (laughs) um and so I think that that's where um that's that's sort of what I see love and support to be, um, regardless whether it's romantic, friendships, family relationships. It's just like, it's very important to communicate in an open discussion about what your capacity is and how much you can be there for somebody. Um, and that in return, I think that transparency can translate to love. Um, love and support. And so that's sort of what I see those two things to be. You know, that's a very good, like, you know, definition, you know, in terms of, you know, loving and you, and, you know, supporting as well. So, you know, I really like the idea that you connect love, not only in terms of like romantic relationships, but also like, you know, friendships. I feel like friendships is definitely an important aspect of love because love isn't just, you know, just like, you know, oh, romantic, you know, relationships, but then love is also like, you know, a type of, you know, like, you know, the friendship and family, because we all have those like, you know, types of, you know, um, it's like that, you know, strong relationship in terms of like, you know, trust and supporting each other. So of course, it's like, you know, the term, that's where, you know, love and support kind of, you know, comes in with each other but then I also like you know the experiences that you brought up with talking about you know the support systems with regards to like you know the friends so it's like you know I would agree like you know in some cases like you know the support systems are you know pretty hard to do because it's like you know because it makes you wonder it's like oh my gosh I hope I said this correctly I hope this didn't come off like you know the wrong way it's like whenever I want to showcase my support for someone But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we are, you know, trying our best, you know, and we want you to know that we are here for you. Of course, it's like, you know, because we're all human at the end of the day. Some of us would be struggling to like, you know, be able to like um, properly showcase or like, you know, present that perspective. So it's definitely a um, it's definitely a great take that you put on it with regards to support. (laughs) No, since we're on the topic of, you know, love and support, you know. What I'm actually going to do is this time, I'm going to just focus on one of the terms, specifically support, in which I'm actually going to connect support with advocacy. So as I mentioned earlier, film is an effective way to raise awareness on political and social issues. In terms of the causes that you advocate for, what are some of the films that inspired you? And do you have any advice on ways we can support struggling communities and help these causes? This is a really great question. And all of your questions have been very, very intentional and very great. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so some films that I tend to gravitate toward are actually surprisingly, it's not like, I would say it's definitely not like the happiest of films, but 
I tend to gravitate towards films that talk about war. Um, and I'm not sure if it's just because I grew up watching a lot of Hong Kong dramas that included a lot of action and like car chases and stuff. So I tend to gravitate towards films that keep me on my toes. And two films that have really inspired me and that has really stuck with me that I continue to talk about um, in a lot of like film discussions with my film classes. Uh, One is First They Killed My Father, which is about survivor Luang Ung's experience as a child soldier, well, as a child, um, basically like uh, her and her family were uh, forced to were forced to um, move into like the Cambodian genocide camps that the Khmer Rouge had organized. And so she takes us through her memoir of her experience, um, of her experiences having to survive through that as a child. And so Angelina Jolie and the Wang Ung collaborated and really turned this memoir into a film. And that's where first they killed my father became such a masterpiece, at least in my perspective. I think because it's of Southeast Asian descent um, in terms of the story, it really has inspired me to want to do something similar, but also different about showing my father's experience as a refugee. Um, And you know, I just remember that my father talked a lot about uh, the bombings and what that was like for his family growing up. And so I really want to do something like that and include his community, similarly to how First They Killed My Father um, included the Cambodian community and some, uh, many of which were actually survivors of the Khmer Rouge. And so um, I, that's definitely a film that has inspired a lifelong project or a lifelong goal of mine um, to showcase my father's experience. Um, Because I think that with the traumas of war as a child comes with PTSD that in many Asian communities, mental health is not really talked about. It's something that is has long been seen as kind of taboo in some ways. It's just, you don't, you just don't talk about it. It just kind of doesn't exist, but we all go through it. And so I see that with that um, internalized trauma that, that has festered into many bad habits of my father's and a lot of kind of toxic masculinity traits. So I really want to translate that into a film, hopefully so that, others can see that their experiences are not alone, their internalized trauma is not alone. Um, And so that's a film that has long inspired me um, since I've watched about two years ago. Um, The other film I recently just watched, I believe I watched it for the first time last month, and it is, uh, oh man, Oh, it's called Beasts of No Nation. And again, both of these films are on Netflix. Um, Beasts of No Nation, I forget who the director was, but um, I just know that I think the director went to UC Santa Cruz um, because I remember doing some research afterwards. But I don't remember the director's name. Um, but Beasts of No Nation, again, kind of goes into war in the perspective of a child. And I think that When you see such atrocities from the perspective of a child, because a child's perspective is so pure, it's so blunt, and it's so (laughs) real and raw as well in sort of its purest form, I think that that's something, again, it really inspired me to want to do a lot of on-set filming um, if, let's just say, my goal of showcasing my father's story is to happen um, later on in my life. Um, I think that that, I think all those films, they stick in my mind because of how blunt it is. 
um, of course, there's the question of ethics, <laughs> but I think that sometimes to show the truest stories, there are bound to be uncomfortable feelings. And I think that in order to have these open discussions about how can we ensure that these atrocities don't continue to happen, we do have to look into the past. And unfortunately, the past does contain a lot of grief, a lot of sadness. Um, but they did happen. And those stories are real. And those stories should not be forgotten. So those two films have really stuck with me. I remember after I watched Beasts of No Nation, I just kept thinking back to this one scene in particular where the child misrecognizes a woman as his mother. And I won't go into too much detail. I don't want to spoil it. But that scene really stuck to me. I kept repeating that in my head um, because it was just so... There's just so many things tied into how that child must have felt, um, even though the screenplay itself was not necessarily true. Um, the outline of it was based off of real research, true events. So long answer. <laughs> uh, first, They Killed My Father and Beasts of No Nation are two films that really has uh inspired me a lot thank you for sharing you know thank you so much Wednesday for sharing all of those you know so to be fair I've never actually I haven't seen any of those yet but you know thank you for suggesting them and you know thanks for letting me know that they're on Netflix because I'll definitely check them out pretty soon and you know I remember that you mentioned like a lot of your some of your inspiration mainly comes from like the war film <laughs> war film genre so the war film genre in a way like yes even depending on where it's made even if some like unfortunately depending on the director even if unfortunately there can be instances where like the director can implement their own personal biases but at the end of the day war films are kind of a great way to like you know showcase like political issues that are ongoing and even if it's from whether it's from the past or the future or the present okay like you know it's just, it provides like a good starting point in terms of, you know, being able to um, provide some of the situations, some of the political and socioeconomic, like, you know, struggles and situations of various communities. And, you know, war films are, you know, a great way to like help, or it's, a, it's like a great way to like first present that out there because it's like, even if there's like, you know, some personal biases and as well as like some like, some like, you know, stuff that they, some spectacles that they implement in there, like the overall, like the their, overall, like they, it has that like background of, you know, of, of a political, like, you know, event happening. So I'd say definitely the war films are a great start to like showcase it. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, the second to the last question I wanted to ask was, so... Unfortunately, many conflicts happen within film itself, whether it's on set or even in instances where individuals are just straight up unprofessional. But here's the thing. I understand things are bound to happen, but at the end of the day, we're still a crew, okay? We're still a team. Therefore, what I wanted to ask was, what would you say is the importance of maintaining love and support within a team? Hmm, that's very interesting. I think that as someone who has gone through some mishaps, <laughs> um, I was in my Cinema 204 class and a peer had erased my entire SD card without my permission. And this just happened uh, before we went into lockdown um, back in March. And I think that in that instance, it's not that I wasn't, of course, like there were a lot of footage from my SD card over the years, actually. Um, I think I had about three years worth of footage, photos, memories, um, and it was just deleted, you know? And I think that, I think I was open to forgiveness, um, but I wasn't, 
I also understood where it's like, I'm not going to just allow myself to invalidate my experience and just to grudgingly let go of that um, because it's someone taking away something from me, something so personal from me and someone that I hardly even know, you know, (laughs) someone that I just met that we're just starting to work together and that's already being, um, that's already being taken away. And so it wasn't that I wasn't open to letting that instance in the past not be like completely let go, but I was willing to reach sort of like a conversation of like, hey, this happened and this is an acknowledgement that this happened. How can I make it better? Um, If there's any way that I can, if there's any way that I can provide support. But I think that with building a crew, it's really important. And ever since that experience, I think that it is very important to find people that you can have disagreements with, but you are all willing to respect each other for your differences and allow for these open discussions to happen where everyone just sort of lets go of their pride for a moment and really allows everyone to feel listened to and to allow each other to admit, hey, like, I didn't know that. Or, hey, like, you're right. Like, I never thought about your perspective because I personally never experienced it. And sort of admit that there is not necessarily something wrong, but just something that wasn't learned before. Like, we don't know everything. And at that instance, when that happened, when that peer of mine or that classmate of mine uh, erased my whole SD card, it was not just that instance. It was that whole time of um, leading up to it where it was, there was a lot of, you know, I had volunteered to go first with a camera demo, but all the men in the group was just sort of dominating the space, dominating the camera. And again, I'm not saying that all men are like that, but it just so happened that the people that I was working with were primarily men and there was only one other um, one other woman <laughs> on the team with me. And so I think that it comes a lot from the foundation. It's about entering the space, knowing that there are bound to be disagreements. There are you know, there's this Chinese saying where there's like one bag of rice, but 10 different types. You know, there's pieces of rice that are like half broken. There's pieces of rice that are not fully colored, a little bit stained. You know, there's some that are a little bit crooked looking, you know, there, there's one like project that you're given, but there's 10 different ways to do it. Um, and I, I think that having the all those 10 ways there needs to be a foundation of respect and clearly that wasn't present um in that moment in that instance that I had that I've been talking about so I think to answer that is to have love and support on the team it's really about having an open mind and something that I learned from my cinema 340 and 341 class um they were like a combined class so two classes in one, basically, um, is that I loved how Dr. Bernardi talked about entering the class thinking that you are wrong most of the time or that you just don't know something because it allows you to grow and it really allows you to accept others' criticism and take what you think will be beneficial for you to thrive and let go of maybe things that you don't feel like will help you to thrive, but at least you gave it that chance and that consideration. And so I think that in order to have that love and support, you need to have that foundation um, develop with your crew, with your set, with your team, that those things needs, those things all should be a priority. And if you can't, you know, if you just can't work in that type of environment, then it's just not the place for you, I think, you know? Um, So that's what I think in terms of that, having gone through a mishap myself. um, There needs to be that sort of boundary there. 
um, there needs to be that respect there. There can be disagreements. And I think sometimes disagreements lead to even better results and better projects and, you know, a result that maybe the team didn't even think could be possible, but it happened. But again, if there's not that sense of respect there, then it's just kind of going to crumble apart, I think. I'm really sorry to hear about the SD card situation, you know. No, I just, you know, with regards to like the other person, I hope like, you know, he or she like was able to apologize for doing so. But at the end of the day, like, considering you said that there was like years of, you know, footage in that card, you know, just to hear that all of it is gone. I, I really feel sorry because it was like, you know, all of that is like very important. Those are big memories. But what I got to say is like, you know, I know that the way you're handling it is like, you know, I, I could move on from it. And, you know, I won't hold a grudge with this. But at the end of the day, there has to be a bound. There's still a boundary. And on top of that, like, I still kind of way in a way deserve like, you know, as much respect as everyone else on the team. So by doing so, it's like, you know, the way you're handling it is like, you know, I won't hold a grudge, but it's like at the end of the day, like. I still expect some type of respect, especially for what just happened. So I really like the perspective that you went with that. And, you know, going back to like, you know, some of like, you know, the male domination that's happening in the film industry. I remember you mentioned that a lot of like the, your Cinema 204 class, there was also like a bunch, it was like mainly men. And then it's like, you know, a lot of them kept like taking over like the camera demos, camera demos, even when you would want an opportunity to volunteer. So yeah, I agree with you. Like, of course, not all, not all men are, are like that. Okay. And you know, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Like not all of them are like that, but it's like, of course, it's like, considering if we're like in this class and that's something that happened, that's bound, that happens, of course, like we're going to like speak on that in terms of working on set, like as a crew. The best advice is actually the agree to disagree, you know, because it's like, yeah, even if we disagree, even if we disagree on this, we're disagreeing on this because we as a team want to make the best product as much as possible. Of course, we are bound to have our differences, but we should put our differences aside at the end of the day. And of course, we could make disagreements. But as long as the reason for the disagreements is to support each other to create the best products, you know, I agree with you there. And, you know, I really like, you know, admire your perspectives on all of these. So, you know, thank you so much for like, you know, sharing, like, you know, that perspective. And it really like, you know, is a very important one, really enforces it. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm glad that uh, that my perspective doesn't sound too intrusive. <laughs> um, again, like, I really want to reiterate that. I, I'm not saying that all men no, are not. bad again like um, I think that there is things like this do happen and unfortunately like it happens a lot of times with men and in my circumstance it happened with men again so um, there is that accountability that I think is really important to post there and I think too as women we're constantly taught to or for a very long time for generations like women have been taught to be submissive to not speak out to not cause a scene because if we speak out about something it's like oh you're being dramatic and again just sort of like that um that invalidation and so it's not that I'm not willing to forgive you but also it's like, I'm not going to forget, you know, I think that we're taught to have to, as women, we have to forgive and forget, you know, um, constantly accommodate. But again, it's like, I think in, on the topic of love and support, it's like, we also have to understand it's not just love and support for, you know, because if you don't, have self-love if you don't support yourself you really can't love others you really can't support others um you know sometimes you you do have to have that little sense of selfishness um in order for you to be selfless that might not like make sense at all but <laughs> just like I think that's a thought that 
I definitely had um, while debriefing about that perspective. No, no, that all makes, that all totally makes sense. You know, that's something that I kind of want to work on myself. Cause it's like, you know, I'm like a very, like, you know, very giving person, you know, but I kind of wish I knew how to sometimes, you know, at times people often tell me this, Daniel, it's okay to be selfish. At times you have to be selfish, but it's like, you know, and I agree with them there. It's just really hard for me to do that. Cause it's like, you know, I'm just, such a nice person deep down inside but I feel like you know but then when you bring up that perspective you have to have a little bit of selfishness in order to be selfless towards others that's actually a very important point it's like and it kind of goes back to the to the instance how can you support others if you don't support yourself how can you love others if you don't even love yourself so in a way that all makes sense when see And on top of that, another thing I also want to mention is regards to, you know, some of the social dynamics. I also hope myself that I never mean to sound intrusive either. But, you know, I just want to make sure I just want to let you know, like, you know, everything that you're saying sounds really good. And, you know, thank you so much. All of your perspectives definitely make sense. And, you know, I really love the way that you, you know, present them. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I guess uh, my final question would be, do you have any final takeaways with regards to love and support? I think that I am still, I think I'm still learning how to, I think diving into like personal life now, at least looking into like my relationship. And um, I think something that I have been trying to learn is that what I seek for support may not be the support that someone else thrives off of. Um, what someone else's love language may be. And I think love language constantly evolve. You know, we're changing as people, we're growing. And, um, you know, you and I, we're young adults and there's so much more self-discovery to be made that I think love languages change all the time. And so I'm trying to learn what my love language is so that I can better communicate that. Um, I, I remember during those five months of just sort of like anxiety driven long distance, um, it was definitely like a lot, you know, and I think it's like very hard to communicate as is because, you know, language means something different for everyone, but it's also really hard when you're trying to communicate through a phone, such deep thoughts and such deep feelings, um, And again, like I was trying to show my love in the way of uh, care that came off a little bit, I guess, like mom-like. And that wasn't really what was, that's not what my partner thrived off of. And so as I'm growing in this relationship and as I'm growing in life, even, I'm learning how to... um, I'm learning how to love and support those around me in the way that they thrive off of. And um, because I think for so long, I was sort of instilled. Um, Maybe it's just like my upbringing, but I was very much instilled like, this is what love is. This is what support is. And so my version of love and support is very different from like my partners. And we grew up not only on two different sides of California, but we grew up in two different cultures. Um, And he's like a third generation, third generation, I think maybe second generation um, immigrant. And so I'm first generation immigrant. Um, And so there's a vast difference there too, in terms of what love and support looks like for first gen students with parents who are immigrants or refugees. Um, It's so immediate versus second generation, you have a little bit more of a distance there. Um, So yeah, I think that's sort of where I'm still learning in terms of takeaways. Um, I'm sure I'll look at this a year from now and I'll be like cringing at myself. (laughs) But at at least in this moment, I think that I'm learning that my perspective on love and support will continue to evolve, but the core will always be the same in terms of, I see love and support as unconditional care. 
um, really making the other person um, feel comfortable and feeling like they can thrive and feel safe and included in their environment. And hopefully I can be that anchor for them. Um, but again, in order to do that, I do need to take better care of myself, um, support myself better, not constantly be like, oh my God, you're just this awkward potato. And like, like I, I do need to hype myself up a little bit more <laughs> from time to time. And I love that this kind of turned into, in some way or another, I uh, this semester I took a class with Sumya Barons and we watched an episode of The Love Tapes. And basically there were um, groups of interviewees ask the same question of what is love and everyone's perspective was different so i i like that this kind of this podcast is somewhat like a love tapes episode um where it's different for everyone and this is just my perspective in this time of my life you know Wensi, i really like you know the way that we closed it off, you know, talking about like, you know, ways we want to grow, you know, ways that, you know, some stuff that we definitely want to do like in the future, you know, I really like how, you know, we all end this with, you know, what can we do to, you know, so that way, you know, we could grow and like, what are some stuff that we need to learn? Because, you know, because it's like, you know, me, myself, especially like, you know, being the host of, you know, the Pals podcast, I have to admit myself, there's still stuff that I need to work on myself. And, you know, there's still a bunch of things that I want to improve on and get better at. So, of course, it's like, you know, we're all humans and we're always going to keep continuing to grow. And, you know, and with regards to like, you know, that we are pals, you know, especially the experience podcast, this is a great way to like, you know, this is a great opportunity to learn because it's like, you know, not only could we does this like you know help us to understand ourselves better but then other audiences especially our fellow pals you know who are watching this they could you know they could we could use this as an opportunity for them to learn you know ways to learn something about us and then you know learn ways on how to better you know spread positivity appreciation love and support so you know i really like the the stuff that you provide because it's like you know it's very relatable wednesday i'm glad that it was um, relatable in that way that we had some connect connection in that way, um, especially in this time where it's just like, we're all isolated. It's hard to like find connections, like genuine connections with each other besides through like a class setting or um, it's just sort of like a setup setting. So I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, we were able to like have this discussion and I think it's really important to close off things with an optimistic or positive note um yeah I, I think that there's always ways to find hope and a silver lining at the end of the tunnel we're all going through this dark tunnel right now of like a pandemic and there's a lot of dark things so why not make better lighter things um yeah I recently watched um a film Oh, I forgot what it was called uh, about the soldier. And it, it was based on a true story, a soldier who had gone into World War II without fighting with a single weapon. He was working as uh, an aide, um, basically like a hospital aide person. And, um, you know, he was saying like, I, I'm already going into a situation where there's people dying around me. So my goal is that I can go into this war field to try to save life because everywhere around me, there's life being lost. And so that really stuck with me. And I think that that's sort of where I always try to end my films and <laughs> these sort of like conversations, these discussions. Um, because yeah, it's not to dismiss that there aren't terrible things happening but it's to say that there is hope that it will get better so thank you for having me today you're welcome um so I just want to say you know in response to what you uh were mentioning Wednesday I just want to say you know you're welcome you know but I actually want to say myself you know thank you so much for you know coming on the pals tv the experience podcast you know it was very like you know 
it was very wonderful to, you know, interview you. And, you know, this dialogue we had was super informative and, you know, everything that we discussed was important, you know? So I know even, you know, even if like our conversation went on for a long time, I actually believe that that's pretty good because the fact that we managed to have a long conversation, it shows that it's very engaging and we're both enjoying it. So it's like, you know, I honestly don't mind the length of it because it's like, you know what, we're really enjoying the conversation. And it's like, you know, based on how like engaging it is, of course, it's like we're, we would want to stick on to like, you know, this topic. So, but yeah, that was pretty good. And to be fairly honest here, I don't even think we got, even got to discuss everything. So as a result of that, honestly, Wensi, I really hope to interview you again in the future because, you know, this was a really amazing dialogue. So in the future, I would love to interview you again. Sure, that would be very fun. This was a very fun experience. It's interesting to be on the other side and being interviewed. I'm oftentimes on the other side interviewing people for documentaries. So um, that's it was a good switch up. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Perfect. So I guess um, before we go, I wanted to ask. So how can we, the fellow pals, stay in touch with you? And are there any other platforms of yours that you want us to check out? Um, so the best way to stay connected with me, um, probably Instagram, which you all have. Um, Instagram, I'm pretty most, pretty much the most active in terms of social media. Um, and also my YouTube channel is actually linked to my Instagram. So little self promo here but again we're all about self-love um, so if you all want to check out my channel um support your fellow asian american um i don't even know if i'm if i would be considered an artist because i just make singing covers and oh, primarily but um <laughs> but um yeah if you want to support my channel no pressure um it's actually linked on my instagram and yeah i think that's the best ways to connect with me. Perfect. So I just want to say, you know, thank you so much, Wenzi, once again, for this wonderful discussion. And, you know, I just want to like mention once again, to you pals who are attending SF State right now, be sure to check out the Feminist Filmmaker Fellowship. It's a very great club that's at SF State. And, you know, they do a lot of filmmaking related projects. So I encourage you all to check them out. They'll be there in the spring semester. So yeah, if you have any like, you know, other questions, be sure to follow their Instagram page, which I will link below for more updates. Also, all of you, don't forget to check out Freaky. It's a really entertaining film. Oh my gosh, I loved it so much. <laughs> oh my gosh, I really loved it so much, Wednesday. Well, that's it for today. Happy holidays, my fellow pals. It's your boy, Daniel Bendian, signing off for today. Bye-bye, pals.